one of the most elementary manifestations of consciousness and conscious action in plant life is what has been called the gravity sense or the sense by which the plant recognizes the up and down direction of growth. The germinating seed always sends its roots downward no matter how the seed may be placed in the ground. This cannot be held to result merely from the action of gravitation for the sprouts move upward and away from the center of gravity just as truly as the roots move downward and toward it. Experiments have proven that this sense of direction is as much a true sense as that of any of the special senses of the lowly animal life forms. The experiment has been tried of turning around a sprouting seed, the result being that in a day or so the roots will be again found to be turning downward and the sprouts turning upward. A French botanist, Duhamel, once placed some beans in a cylinder filled with moist earth. After they had begun to sprout, he turned the cylinder a little to one side. The next day, he turned it a little further in the same direction. Each day, he would turn it a little more, until finally, it had described several full circles. Then he took out the plant, and shaking off the clinging earth, he found that the beans, roots and sprouts had described circles, two perfectly formed spirals being shown, one of the tiny roots and the other of the tiny sprouts. The roots, in their constant endeavor to move downward, had formed one perfect spiral, while the sprouts, in the constant effort to rise upward, had described another perfect spiral. No amount of effort will cause the roots of a plant to grow upward, or its sprouts to grow downward. Each root and sprout has its own sense of direction, to which it faithfully and invariably responds. In the same way, and from a similar cause, the tendrils of climbing plants will faithfully move toward the nearby support, and if they are untwined, they will return during the next night to the old support, if possible. Moving pictures carefully prepared and taken over a long period show that the movements of these tendrils to be akin to the movements of the limbs of an animal, the feelers and graspers of the octopus, for example. Not only have the roots of plants the general sense of direction, which causes them to grow downward in spite of all attempts to prevent them, but they have also the sense of moisture, which causes them to seek the direction of water. Many plants also turn their leaves and blossoms to the light, no matter how often they are turned in the opposite direction. Potatoes in dark cellars will often send forth their sprouts 20 or 30 feet in the direction of light, which shows through a tiny crack in the wall. Likewise, plants possess the sense of taste to a very high degree in some cases. By means of this sense, they are able to detect differences in substances and to choose those substances which are conducive to their nutrition. They are able to distinguish between poor and rich soil, and also between different chemicals of differing nutritive values. They also move their roots in the direction of the best food supply, and also toward moisture. Not only do the roots of plants move in the direction of water, but instances have been cited in which the leaves of plants will bend over during the night and dip themselves in a vessel of water several inches away. Many students are doubtless familiar with the instance of the sensitive plants which exhibit a marked degree of sensibility to touch. Other plants are very sensitive to degrees of light and they close at certain hours, the time varying according to the species of the plant. It was formerly held that this sensitiveness to light was merely a chemical response to the presence of light, but recent experiments have shown that such plants, when placed in a dark room, will continue this closing for several days in a gradually lessening degree, thus indicating the presence of a habit within their consciousness, which habit indicates the presence of mind even more forcibly than does the closing itself. Certain ferns will wither if their fronds are touched too often. In the case of seeds, the presence of consciousness and mental operations are manifested. Not only in the process of sprouting, but also in other processes, does the seed show signs of life and mind. Certain seeds are carried to their future abode by means of running streams, along which they work their way to congenial soils by means of tiny projecting filaments which they move as legs. 
and thus propel themselves to shore. A botanist has said regarding a certain species of these swimming seeds, so curiously lifelike are their movements that it is almost impossible to believe that these tiny objects make good progress through the water, are really seeds and not insects. A variety of orchid discovered by E. A. Suvercrop of Philadelphia several years ago grows upon the trunks of trees hanging over swampy places along the bank of the Rio de la Plata and streams of the neighborhood. When this orchid is in want of water, the slender stem gradually unwinds until it dips into the water. Then the stem slowly coils around and winds up to discharge upon the part of the plant from which the roots spring the water which it has sucked up into its hollow space or tube within its interior. Sometimes when water is absent from directly under this plant, the stem moves first in this direction and then in another in its search for water and finally finding the water, it performs the process above described. If this plant is touched while the stem is extended, it acts much like the sensitive plant or mimosa and the stem coils up into a spiral more rapidly than when it is lifting water. The experiments of that wizard of plant life, Luther Burbank, give us many illustrations of the manner in which the mind in the plant will respond to changed environment and to take advantage of improved conditions thereof in the direction of adapting itself thereto. No one can study the works of modern botanists or work long among plants without discovering for himself many facts serving to prove that there is not only life among the plants but also sufficient mind to serve the purposes and needs of the existence of the plant. Some scientists have thought it possible that by changing the environment of the plant sufficiently in the direction of calling out latent possibilities of mental action, it is probable that plants may be evolved which would approach in their mental activity that of lower forms of animal life, if not indeed exceed the latter. The Plane of the Animals Here, once more, we discover that there is no fixed dividing line between the adjoining planes of consciousness. Just as the mineral consciousness is closely blended into the plant consciousness, as we have seen, so is the plant consciousness closely blended into the animal consciousness. In fact, in the lowly forms of animal life, it is almost impossible at times to state positively whether the particular form under consideration is a plant or an animal. Forms which science formerly considered animal are not placed in the category of plant life and other forms which science once held to belong to the plant kingdom are now placed in the category of animal life. The occultist recognized that these disputed forms dwell in the region in which the two respective planes blend and intermingle as has been stated before in these pages. Consciousness in animal life varies from the first faint glimmerings in the single cell creatures in the slime of the ocean bed to the full dawn of the highest forms of animal life like the horse, the dog, the elephant, etc. In each and every case, however, it will be found that each creature is endowed with a sufficient degree of intelligence to meet its needs and requirements, to adapt it to its environment. As the environment increases in complexity, the form of animal life has either adapted its consciousness to meet the requirements or else has perished in the course of evolution. Both science and the occult teachings inform us that animal life had its origin in the slime of the primeval ocean beds and took the form of the single cell creatures. The best known form of single cell animal is the moneron, or plural monera, which is composed of but a single cell and is like a tiny drop of glue. It belongs to the lowest class of animal life known as the protozoa. The moneron lives in water and is a very minute, shapeless, colorless, slimy, sticky drop of protoplasmic substance. It has no organs of any kind, and all of its parts are similar. It lacks the separate organs or parts with which to perform the offices of the living creature as found in the higher forms of life. And yet, this organless creature performs the processes of life known respectively as nutrition, reproduction, sensation and will action. Every part of the moneron is capable of absorbing food and oxygen. It is all stomach and all lungs. Moreover, it is all reproductive organism. 
It has no distinction of sex, but reproduces itself by simply growing larger and then dividing itself in two, and the process is over. There being two monera, where only one moneron was the moment before. And yet this simple creature receives impressions from the outside and responds thereto. It seeks its food and escapes its enemies. It has all the mind it needs. Next in the rising scale of animal life, we find the amoeba. This creature is also a one-celled animal. It progresses by a continuous projection of false feet and a subsequent drawing in of the same, which gives it the appearance of a many-fingered or many-footed thing. This creature has the beginning of parts and organs. In the first place, it has a nucleus at its center and also an expanding and contracting cavity within itself which it uses for holding, digesting and distributing its food, a rudimentary stomach, so to speak. It also has something like a skin on its surface and it cannot be turned inside out, like its brother the Moneron, without disturbing its life. Let us pause here for a moment before passing on to the consideration of the higher forms of animal life. The purpose of the pause is to call your attention to the resemblance of the monera and the amoebae to the cells of which the human body is composed. The ordinary cells of the higher animal and mankind closely resemble the monera in many ways, while the white corpuscles of the blood of animals and men bear a striking resemblance to the amoeba as far as is concerned their size, general structure and movements. In fact, science classes them as amoeboids. The white corpuscles of our blood, these amoeboids, change their shape, take food in an intelligent manner, and live an apparently independent life, with movements showing undoubted thought and will. The cells of which the bodies of animals and men are composed are really independent living creatures, each of which is possessed of sufficient mind to enable it to perform its necessary life work and offices. By means of the operation of what occultists know as the group mind, by which a number of independent cells coordinate their activities, these cells perform the coordinated work of the organism. Each of these cell minds manifests a perfect adaptation for its particular work. The work of those cells, in extracting from the blood the exact amount of nourishment needed by it, is but a minor evidence of the presence of such mind in them. The process of digestion, assimilation, etc. is another instance of the intelligence of the cells and cell groups. In the healing of wounds, in which the cells rush to the points at which their services are needed, we have a striking instance of the selective intelligence of the cells. The cells of the body are constantly at work, performing the multitudinous offices of the organism, working separately, in small groups and in great groups according to the nature of the work to be done. Some of the cells of the body are active workers, manufacturing the secretions and fluids needed in the varied work of the system. Others belong to the reserves and are kept under waiting orders, awaiting the call to duty in the case of an accident or other emergency. Some are stationary, others remain stationary until they are called into motion to meet some requirement. Others are constantly moving about, some making regular trips and others being rovers. Some of the moving cells perform the work of carriers, some move from place to place doing odd jobs, others perform scavenger work and a large number are employed on the police force of the body or else constitute the cell army. The carrier cells, the red corpuscles of the blood, travel in the arteries and veins, carrying a load of oxygen on the outward arterial trip and bringing back a return cargo of the waste products of the system to be burned up in the lungs. Other cells force their way through the walls of the arteries and veins and through the tissues of the body on repair work. The police cells and the soldier cells in the blood protect the system from the attacks of germs, bacteria and other harmful visitors or invaders. One of the protecting cells coming in contact with an intruder of this kind will enmesh it and then proceed to devour it. If the task be too heavy for one cell, it will call the assistance of others and the combined force will seize the intruder and try to eject it from the system. The work of the cells in repairing a wound furnishes one of the most striking in illustrations of the presence of intelligence in the cells.